Hey everybody, this is Aaron Reed with NurseMastery.com and today we're going to go over a short intro tutorial to EKGs for nurses. We're going to start off with a five-step process that's going to help you interpret what type of an EKG uh, it is that you're looking at. First, I want to go over a little bit of the basics. We're going to talk about the waves that you're going to find in a QRS and the conduction system involved with that and then the mechanical contractions that are secondary to those or that they cause. So first, we're going to talk about this wave right here. That's a P wave. That's depolarization of the atria. So that is the P wave. That should be followed by a mechanical contraction of the atria, both of them. Next, you're going to have a QRS. The Q is a downward deflection, the R is an upward deflection, and the S is another downward deflection. This is called the isoelectric line. So when I say below the isoelectric line, that's what I'm referring to. So the Q and the S are both negative. The R is positive. So taken as a whole, this is the QRS. The QRS is, is depolarization of the ventricles, aka contraction. The electrical signal is creating a contraction of the ventricles to eject that blood through the pulmonary artery and the aorta on the left-hand side as well. And then your last wave right here is known as the T wave. The T wave is not depolarization, it is repolarization of the ventricles. And you may, you may be asking yourself, where's the repolarization of the atria? Well, the repolarization of the atria is hidden behind the QRS, so you're never going to see that, unfortunately. So again, just to review, we have the P, Q, R, S, and then the T wave. Talk a little bit about intervals, which we'll be addressing later in our five-step process, but this is the PR interval from the beginning of the P wave to the beginning of the Q wave. The normal distance for that should be 0 0.012 to 0 0.02. All right. Now, this gets us into talking about small boxes and large boxes. That's probably pretty difficult to read, so I'll write that a little bit um, larger later on. When we talk about grid paper, we're talking about the paper that the QRS um, complex, the EKG, and everything else is printed upon. So what we're going to talk about is boxes. Now, we have a grid set up here, so we have small boxes contained within one larger box. Okay, So you're going to see a lot of these on the grid paper. Now, each one of these small boxes here is worth 0.04 seconds, so that's a measure of time and from left to right of distance. So that's going to be superimposed upon this um, QRS uh, complex so that you'll be able to measure it. Okay. So we've got our small boxes. Each one is worth 0 0.04 seconds. Now if we add these all together, we've got one, two, three, four, five. So we've got five small boxes within one large box. A large box is worth 0 0.20 seconds. So if you count them up, you've got one, two, three, four, five, and then within that is one large box. The large boxes are denoted by a thicker line on the grid paper, so that'll be um, easier to tell that way. So when you're measuring things like the PR interval or the QRS or anything else, what you want to do is count the number of boxes from the beginning to the end of what, whatever it is that you're calculating. Again, small boxes 0 0.04 seconds and large boxes are the um, sum of five of those, so that would be 0 0.20 seconds. So we talked about this. This is the, the uh, PR interval followed by the QRS. The QRS is going to be just like it says, the beginning of the Q and the end of the S. That should be 0 0.06 to 0 0.11. All right, and you probably can't read that, but I'm gonna I'm gonna sort that out later. And then you've got the um, the QT segment here, which we're not really going to talk about. What we're going to focus on in interpreting the basic EKG is just those two things. All right, so now let's talk about the actual steps involved. So the first step, what we want to look at is the rate, and the rate is the number of times that the heart contracts in a 60 second period, also known as one minute, aka beats per minute. Now, there is a rate for the atria and the ventricles. The P wave represents the atria, the QRS represents the ventricle. If we have a normal sinus rhythm with no dysrhythmias or arrhythmias, then we're going to see a P for every QRS and hopefully everything is logical and in order in that fashion. So what we're going to do is assume that and we're going to count the number of R waves. Now the R wave represents the ventricle which is the most important contraction of the heart. It's also the most evident on a um, EKG strip. So we're going to count the number of R's over the course of a single strip. Now typically a single strip is six seconds long. So if we count the number of beats in a six second period, multiply that by 10, that's 60 seconds, and that's the number of beats 
in um, one minute, so that would be your beats per minute. So if there was five R waves on a six second QRS strip, we'd multiply that and we would get a, a total of 50. So five times 10 is 50. Another way to do that would be to count the number of big boxes. Now again, big boxes are denoted by the um, bold lines. So we count the number of big boxes in between each R wave. Again, each R wave. So hopefully what we're going to find is one that occurs, an R wave that occurs on a, a large box or a, um, a thick line. And then we can count the number of boxes that occur before the next R wave shows up. And what we do with that number is we divide it into 300. So let's say that an R takes place and we count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then another um, R wave occurs, that's 5, and we're going to divide 5 into, into 300, and dividing 5 into 300 gives us a rate of 60. So 60 beats per minute. That's the most important step. That's our first step, and that's known as calculating the rate. So our next objective is to um, figure out what the rhythm is. Now, when we talk about rhythm, we're, we're talking about regularity of the heartbeat. From heartbeat to heartbeat, there should be a, the same distance in between each one of those. So when we're talking about the rhythm, what we want to do is, first we want to spell it right. I hope I did. Rhythm. There we go. Rhythm. So basically what we want to figure out is there's an equal distance between the R waves. Again, the R waves are most prominent, they're most visible, we're going to use those, so we're going to bust out our calipers again, and we're going to make sure that the distance between each R wave is the same from QRS complex to QRS complex. Now, um, a rhythm can either be regular or irregular, so if there's a constant distance between those in terms of boxes, in large boxes, we're going to call that regular, and if not, we're going to call that irregular. This is going to give us some clues about what type of an, what type of an arrhythmia may be happening. So you could have a sinus arrhythmia, which is typically benign, or you could have an atrial fibrillation type of a situation, which means that the electrical impulses originating um, normally in the sinoatrial node are actually coming from somewhere else in the atria, and there, there are many, many of them. And as a result of that, the atria are just quivering and sending all these erratic signals to the ventricles. The ventricles are accepting those through the AV node um, sometimes um, periodically and sometimes regularly so you're gonna have an irregular rate essentially all right so let's move on to step three okay the third step in interpreting an EKG is to look for a P wave now like we said before a P wave occurs before every QRS hopefully so are there P waves do the P waves appear before each one of the QRS's and is there a QRS for every P wave now, if there isn't, we might suspect a block because, again, the signal originates in the sinoatrial node, travels through the AV node where it's slowed down a little bit so that the atria has time to pump and fill the ventricles full of blood before the ventricles accept and then pump again. So if there's um, a missing P wave, we could have a, um, a block uh, of different degrees. We could have a preatrial uh, complex, which are beats, again, originating erratically um, in the atria that mask the uh, P wave. So those are valuable clues. Let's move on to number four. Okay, so number four is the QRS complex. We talked about the QRS complex, negative deflection, positive, and then negative again. So you wanna ask yourself, is there a QRS? Hopefully there is. And then you're gonna ask yourself what the length is. Now the length of the QRS complex is measured from the beginning of the Q wave to the end of the S wave. And that distance should be 0, 0 0.06 to 0 0.11. Now in terms of small boxes, that would be greater than one small box because each box is worth a 0, uh, 0 0.04, but less than three boxes because three boxes is 0 0.12. So what we're looking for is a 0 0.06 to 0 0.11, okay? Now, this can, can also reveal some clues about what, kind of, what type of rhythm we're looking at or if there's any sort of um, infarcts or injuries or anything like that. So the first thing we're going to talk about is a Q wave. Now a Q wave is, again, no, most Q waves are normal. If a Q wave is exaggerated, it's going to come down like this and then come back up. So that would indicate potentially an old myocardial infarction or a heart attack. All right. So if you see that, that may be what you're looking at. And then we're, what we're going to talk about next is a is a, a delta wave. Now a delta wave is an upslurring of the QRS. So basically the Q is more or less missing, and we're going to call that a delta wave. So that's an upsloping. What happens during a delta wave is that a patient 
potentially has Wolf Parkinson's White Syndrome, which is what we'll talk about later. But these are all very valuable clues. Now, what if a QRS is longer than this distance? What if it's longer than 0.11 seconds? So if it's widened, if it's got a uh, very wide appearance, it could be a pre, uh, premature ventricular complex, which means that the electrical signals that are capturing the, the ventricles, making them beat, are actually originating in the ventricles, which is not a good thing because that's going to uh, mess with the coordination between the atria and ventricles. So if it's wide, it could be a PVC. All right. Also, what if it's less than 0 0.06? Well, if it's less than 0 0.06, that could mean a supraventricular tachycardia, which is a very, very high heart rate, usually above 140 beats per minute, originating um, somewhere above the ventricles. Okay, so the QRS holds a lot of that valuable information. Okay, so the final step is number five, and we're going to talk about the PR interval. Now, again, the PR interval is measured from the beginning of the P wave to the beginning of the QRS, which actually appears to be a delta wave still, so we're just going to put that in there. Boop, there we go. So the PR interval, like we discussed earlier, should be 0 0.12 to 0 0.20. Um, distance from the beginning to the end. All right, and so the important thing about this being longer than the QRS is that we want to allow time for the atria to contract and then that blood to also reach the ventricles so that they're entirely full before um, contracting again so that our cardiac output is optimized. So this distance between the beginning of the P and the beginning of the Q, also known as the PR interval, is very important and we want to measure that. We want to, we want to analyze that every time that we look at, it, at an EKG. Because if that is lengthened, that means that we have a problem with conduction. Again, we have um, potentially a delay. So we could be looking at some kind of a block. Um, now with first degree blocks, that's going to be increased. With um, second degree type 1 blocks, it's going to be increased until one of the QRS drops. So there's a lot of different varieties, but we want to make sure that we know whether or not that is constant from beat to beat and whether it is within the parameters that I've listed um, down here. So that's just some of the um, simple ways that you can look at an EKG. So number one, you want to look at the rate. Number two, you want to look at the rhythm. Number three, you want to look to see if there's a P wave and if there's a QRS for every P wave. Um, number four, you want to make sure that there's a QRS, that's the, it's the appropriate length. And then number five, you want to make sure that you have a PR interval um, that is the appropriate distance as well. So one, two, three, four, five, that's how to quickly interpret an EKG. I hope you enjoy what you saw. You can visit us at nursemastery.com or you can check out any of my other videos and you can check out my eBooks on the Amazon bookstore as well. And and um, I hope you had a good time and good luck. Thanks.